Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm not going to offend your ears this morning, so we're just going to leave it at good morning. I'm so thankful to see everyone here on this wonderful Sunday morning. The sun is shining, and all is right with the world, right? We hope. Um, if there are any guests here this morning, uh, we hope that you feel welcome and will return to worship with us again. And um, Mike's sister is here with us this morning, so welcome. Thank you. Um, just a reminder to please wear your masks as you enter and exit the sanctuary. There are both masks and hand sanitizer in the back should you need either one. I'm sure that most of you are familiar with our little white church. Um, even those who watch us on Facebook or YouTube, you can usually see it in the background on the table there. Um, Marla's father made that for us when <laughs> I was very young. So it was a long time ago, let me tell you. And uh, we pass that around every week to honor special joyful occasions in our lives. Uh, such as birthdays, anniversaries, whatever you feel is wonderful. Just being here together on a Sunday morning is a wonderful occasion after having um, gone through the pandemic and our church being closed, etc. So um, the church is sitting in the back behind the last pew. So if you have a joy in your life, um, <coughs> please a donation into the church. Uh, we keep track of this special fund and uh, we'll determine how it will be used um, later on. So let us begin our service with the call to worship. We gather with joy for Easter brings us new life. Love breaks all bonds and unites us in hope. Christ has defeated death. Let us rejoice and be glad. Come and worship with hearts full of praise. Oh God, we our grateful hallelujahs. As Carol plays hymn number 258, please reflect and rejoice silently as we gather together in this holy place on this beautiful Sunday morning.
Please stand as we say the prayer of adoration and confession. God, our Maker, we come before you this day, giving thanks for all the wonder in your creation, for the detailed perfection revealed in a baby's tiny fingers, in pussy willows unzipping their jackets to greet the spring, in each rock face worn by wind and water, witnessing to your ancient design like wrinkles around an aging spot. These details lift our hearts to praise you, so that the details of the story of the risen Christ lift our hearts to say that we may greet a new week as an occasion to discover him in our midst, making all things new with the springtime of the Spirit. And let us continue together saying, God, our Redeemer, in raising Jesus from the dead, you showed us the power to do all that things for his fear and sorrow to our lives. In his resurrection, Jesus promised to be with us always. Yet we confess we are sometimes uncertain about our presence, unsure if we can trust the promise of resurrection for ourselves. Forgive us when we struggle to trust your goodness for us. Forgive us when we miss the signs of your love in our midst. Amen. Please remain standing. Scripture tells us that there is a time for every matter under heaven, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. In confessing our sins to God, we have offered God our tears of regret. Now is the time to rejoice in God's mercy. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. In Jesus Christ, we have time to make a new start. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I will now do a reading from the Old Testament book of Psalms, Psalm number four. Answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long will you people turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart his faithful servant for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Tremble and do not sin. When you are on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. Offer the sacrifices of the righteous and trust in the Lord. Many, Lord, are asking, who will bring us prosperity? Let the light of your face shine on us. Fill my heart with joy when their grain and new wine abound. In peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, Lord, make me dwell, dwell in safety. That is the reading of the word of the Lord.
source of Easter power and hope. You have walked with your faithful people through many generations, people facing challenge and uncertainty, people seeking your purpose and promise. We still face challenges and uncertainty, even with Easter in our hearts. Walk with us and with those of whom we pray for this day, so that your resurrecting power may lead us in lives of faithfulness. We pray for children and young people. Give them hope rooted in the knowledge that their lives matter to you. Show them how to make a difference in the world, whatever threats they face as they grow. We pray for people of whom age or experience, illness or disability create barriers to full participation in your world. Surround each one in pain or despair with your comfort and renew in each one a sense of dignity and purpose. Show them how much they matter to you and to us. We pray for all those facing grief and loss 
when it is still so hard to gather for support. Give them strength and comfort through your promise of resurrection. We pray for communities challenged by forces beyond their control, natural disaster and political strife. Give courage to those facing challenges and wisdom to those who lead so that well-being may be restored soon and hope for the future revealed. And lastly, we also ask you to be with the needs and concerns of the congregation and friends of Amity Presbyterian Church. We especially pray for Marilyn Baldwin, the family of Johnny Lou Riddlebaugh, the family of Phil Weddle's father, and Lord, we give thanks to you for this beautiful morning. And thank you that we can gather together here in your name. With hopeful hearts, we now offer the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Before I read this morning's scripture, let me pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you have brought your people here together this day. May these words from Scripture help us better know you and what you would have us do as your people in Christ. Amen. So today's Scripture reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 3, verses 12 through 19. Let's all be attentive to these words. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate though he had decided to let him go. You disown the Holy and Righteous One and ask that a murderer be released to you. You kill the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. <clears throat> By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed you, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what had, for, had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. This, my friends, is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So today is going to be a little bit interesting because I'm preaching a sermon on a sermon. And not just a sermon by anyone, but by Peter first leader of the church. So a little added pressure here, but I think we'll get through it pretty well. <clears throat> Our reading is the second in a series that we're doing here at, at Amity on the New Testament book of Acts. From last week, we know that the author of Acts is the same author of the, as the Gospel of Luke. It's kind of like a, like a two-volume set. And the books were both written for a Greek patron by the name of Theophilus, written around um, before the fall of Jerusalem. 
and it tells the story of the birth and growth of the church, kind of like a, like a history book, chapters in a history book. The book starts out with Pentecost, and then it continues. And we keep seeing these superheroes of the church that have had the power of the Holy Spirit bestowed on them. And one of those heroes is Peter, who's doing our sermon today. We just read that Peter asks the crowd, why do you stare at us? Do you remember as a kid being reprimanded by your parents when you were caught staring with someone? Staring at something kind of unusual, something that's a little bit different. You maybe saw someone with some weird clothes on or maybe one of those unusual hairstyles. Now I grew up in the 60s, so I was constantly getting reprimanded by my parents. Looking at someone or something that was out of the ordinary, a situation that you might not expect to see. In the text right before our reading today, something that you would never expect to see has happened. Peter and John were approaching a gate to enter into the temple area in Jerusalem, and they come across this beggar. He can't walk, he's been lame since birth. And as he's passing by, the beggar asks them for some money. Now, this certainly isn't anything that would be unusual for a beggar to ask for money, but what happens right after this? certainly is unusual because Peter tells them he says we have no silver or gold but I will give you something else and he says in the name of Jesus of Nazareth walk and this is exactly what happens and now Peter and John are in this temple court and they're with this man and he's jumping and walking and shouting praises to God. It's no wonder that people are staring at them. Peter has their attention now, and he's not going to pass up this opportunity. An opportunity to reach those that need to hear the message of the gospel. So Peter begins to speak to them. And the words aren't very welcoming, and they aren't very kind words. He's not there to win any friends, and he doesn't hold anything back. He tells the people, he says, You handed my teacher and my friend over to the religious leaders and to the Romans to be killed. You are to be blamed for his crucifixion. He says that these people had an opportunity to stop all that's happened, this injustice, when Pilate even stops and says, what's the justification for these charges? And there aren't any. But they further insist on punishment for Jesus. Do you remember they would shout from the courtyard, crucify him, crucify him. And then the people are given one more opportunity to exonerate Jesus by selecting him over a murderer. But instead, the people select the murderer. Peter doesn't sugarcoat things at all. And he doesn't let them off the hook. He speaks the truth on what they have done, something sinful that they have done in the eyes of God. And the people need to deal with that. And Peter becomes the tool to confront them. I'm sure that the people that were standing around that day really didn't see this coming, this scolding. They had gathered because a man who had been lame since birth had been healed. And now they're getting an earful for what they've done. So the main event in the temple isn't this healing now, but it's this reprimand. 
from Peter. <coughs> a friend of mine who's also been kind of an informal mentor to me uh, is the former senior pastor at Pleasant Hills Presbyterian Church, uh, Reverend Dr. E. Stanley Ott. And over the years, Stan has become an expert in an area of what it means to be a vital church. He's even written several books on the subject, and they're all just excellent books to read. And we use one of those tools at our monthly session meetings. Those of you on session will be familiar with it. He calls it Word Share Prayer. These three words help us to focus as we begin our meetings. We center first on these three things, and then we go about the rest of the needs of the congregation. A second concept from Stan that jumped out at me when I was reading our scripture text for today was another three-word phrase that is critical to a vital church. And that is, reach, grow, and send. Reach, grow, and send. Stan feels that churches first need to reach out to those who need to hear the good news of the gospel. And second, grow its congregation members in faith. And then third, send those same congregation members out to share the gospel themselves. Reach, grow, and send. The early church followed these exact same concepts, and that's one of the reasons that 2,000 years later, we still have the church here among us. And today our scripture is about that reach part of those three words. Peter and John, they've been transformed and energized by the power of the Holy Spirit. And they're on the move. And they're looking for an audience. They're heading to this central place of gathering in Jerusalem, which is the temple. It's the heart of the Jewish faith. And it's where people gather to engage each other. And Peter wants to reach those who are there to now listen. I'm sure we've all had the opportunity to see and hear a street preacher. These are people that through some calling have decided to plant themselves at an intersection somewhere, on a street corner, and share the gospel. And there's usually quite a lot of fire and brimstone words in the message that uh, they're sharing. I worked in downtown for many years, and uh, it was not uncommon to see street preachers, especially in the springtime as people began to get out for lunch. The person would locate themselves at a busy intersection, and then they began to evangelize. Kind of quite interesting to watch, and I find myself kind of off in the distance watching what's going on and trying to determine how effective the street preacher would be. I don't think that any of us, um, including myself, should be judging this style or the motivation behind this kind of evangelism. If a person ends up coming to Christ as a result of it, then there's it's hard to argue that it's not very effective. But I did see many more people crossing the street so that they don't have to be close to this person and hear the words. And many of them, there aren't many of them standing around listening intently. These preachers are using words to persuade a crowd to come to faith in the city of Pittsburgh. These two apostles that we're talking about today, they're doing the same thing, but it's in the city of Jerusalem. Perhaps though, Peter and the Holy Spirit knew that words alone might not be enough to draw a crowd. 
However, if you throw in a man born lame, and he's been healed, and now he's dancing and walking and singing praises to God, well, that would draw people, wouldn't it? Something out of the ordinary. Something to stare at. And with that, the people were ready to listen. They had been reached. Grow and send were also integral in the early church. And we see it clearly in Acts. The members of the early church grew through gathering at people's houses. Today we call them home churches. It was a place to meet and share and read scripture. A place to have a meal and maybe even to remember the Lord's Supper. Members growing in faith in a small and intimate setting. Growing. And the book of Acts is also about sending. The sending out of the apostles, even to the Gentiles. At this point, Peter has no clue that the message of faith that he's preaching is going to go way beyond Jerusalem and way beyond even Palestine. God's going to give all people an opportunity for full restoration through Jesus. The Apostle Paul, who first arrests Christians for being part of this movement, actually becomes the greatest evangelist of the church. And he makes his way into Asia Minor, into Greece, and even to the city of Rome. The early church certainly knew how to reach and grow and send it. Last Sunday here at church, I mentioned a document that the session and I have been working on that lists various responsibilities in the church. We'll be trying to develop and expand on what we do related to things such as discipleship, community outreach, mission, and fellowship. We want all of you, all of you here to be involved. And if we looked at that list, Every one of these ministries, these programs, these activities fit into one of these three categories of reach, grow, or sin. There needs to be ways for us as a church to interact with the community that's out there all around us. There are many that aren't tied to a church at all. I talk to neighbors around the church and and others of people in the community. And I'm amazed at the overwhelming number of people that aren't associated with any church at all. And some of those that even reflect that they're in a denomination don't go to church on an ongoing basis and aren't involved either. We need to reach out, and we need to reach out creatively to these folks and make them feel welcome. We have this huge sanctuary here with all these pews. And we have thousands and thousands of square feet in this building. None of it right now being used. There's tremendous, tremendous opportunity for us as a church in this community. You know, I recognize that the virus has kept us from many of these gatherings. But I believe that those days are coming to an end. We might not have a miracle out here in the front lawn on Euclid Avenue like Peter did back in Jerusalem. But there are other ways that we, and I really mean we, can call attention to the gospel message. We as a church reaching. As a congregation, we also need to continue to grow. What a blessing it was to have our Lenten Bible study this year. Even with the challenges around COVID, we were able to have that study anyways. We had between 12 and 18 people discussing the Gospel of John for six straight weeks. That's pretty terrific, especially for a church our size. And here we're getting 20 people plus 
every Sunday coming to service. And an even larger number are clicking on our YouTube channel, worshiping and hearing scripture. But I believe that we can do more. We can have more studies and more classes, more opportunities to grow as believers. And lastly, sending. You know, the church wasn't meant for us as a group to just kind of huddle together and nurture ourselves. It's so easy and risk-free to put up walls and then stay protected and secure within our own group. As people of faith, we are meant for much more. We're meant to go out and take risks. The church was created to go out into the world this church out into the communities of Dravosburg and West Mifflin and McKeesport to help those in need and to share the gospel message. We can do mission. We can do sending right here in our own backyards. Reach, grow, and send components of all churches, and they should be components of Amity Presbyterian Church as well. So after Peter gets the attention of the crowd by healing this lame beggar, and after he chastises them for being responsible for the death of Jesus, he fortunately doesn't stop there. He doesn't just leave them with a sense of guilt hanging over their heads. No, he does something else. He shares an amazing message with them, one of hope. Listen to these words. This man, the beggar, whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Peter hits them with this idea of faith in the name of Jesus and that such an amazing faith is powerful and with it you can do amazing things. And one of those amazing things is to wipe out sins. And when those sins are wiped out and eliminated, times of refreshing will come. I don't know about all of you, but I could use some refreshing, especially during these days. People and families are struggling. There are health issues, aging parents, unexpected deaths, emotional breakdowns, money needs. There are lots of things out there that are weighing us down. We need to give help and support. And that help and support is also there for us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Peter's plea with the crowds at the temple that day was about making a change in life, turning away from sin, making good decisions, living without accusations, and more about acceptance, having less anger and more self-control, giving rather than taking, moving away from things that cause us pain and suffering, turning from sin. Have you ever played the game board Monopoly? See it there? Well, in it, there's a get out of jail free card. 
By having this card in the game, you get a second chance, an opportunity to be removed from that lonely place on the board that keeps you from being free, where you're stuck and you're stagnant, where you can't go anywhere and you're not contributing to the game. In life, we can find ourselves sometimes similar in such a jail. We get there not by robbing a bank, but by sinning. And in fact, we actually deserve to be in such a place. And when we were in that space, relationships are, are hurting. And life is not going on as intended. There's no opportunities for us to buy boardwalk and park place. We deserve punishment and we deserve death because of our sin. But hope is not lost because there's a Good Friday and an Easter Sunday. Jesus took that sin upon himself and because he did, all of us who believe have been given a get out of jail free card. We get an opportunity to play it before the game is over. My friends, as we leave here today, we are called as the church to embrace the faith that Jesus offers and accept the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can have an impact on our world to change it, to reach, to grow, and to send. To shape life in such a way that people take notice of us. We must do things for the kingdom so that others can stare at us in amazement as the church. It's who we are. Amen. Please stand and join me in our offering prayer of dedication. God, our Maker, you have given us life in a world filled with so much abundance. In Christ, you have given us new life and abundant hope. We offer our gifts to you, though we may have part of your abundance. Bless them and bless us, that we may grow in new life by Christ. Jesus is all the world to me. Thank mm -hmm. you.
leave this place today, be a church where people look and are amazed at what you do and what you represent. Reach, grow, and send. Now go in peace in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's recite together the congregational charge. Wherever we go, God has sent us. Wherever we are, God has put us there. He has a purpose in our feet.